Okay, I have 530. So we begin with the special order of the day, which is Holly administering the oath of office to our newly reelected, reelected or elected um, members of the board. Um, I was just going to make a suggestion, and that is, I, I thought about this after everything had gone out, is it kind of defeats the purpose of um, having it when there's no one here watching it. And I, I was I wondered thinking, about that. <laughs> maybe we should uh, do this the first part uh, right after we reconvene instead. What is that a possibility, Gina? Can we do that? Would everybody? We've done it at the start of the meeting because, um, I mean, it, it doesn't really make a big difference this year, but traditionally we've done it at the start of the meeting because if anybody was turning over, we wouldn't be able to, you know, have a closed session. Ah then do the oath of office. And so for consistency, we thought we would just do it this, the same way to avoid confusion. Um, but I, I don't have a legal objection under these particular circumstances to doing it at the start of the meeting, if, if that's. I, I leave it to my new members to decide. <laughs> um, is anybody from the public going to care? Uh, only if your mother is the there and wants to see you on the screen. <laughs> She's not attending. So. Okay. All right, then why don't we just go ahead and do it we can with the way we always have it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, repeat after me. I state your name, do solemnly swear or affirm. I, Bob Fultz. I do solemnly swear. Or small, I do solemnly swear in the firm. It's going to be great. You should do this I one at a time. Yeah. What do you think? Do solemnly swear in the firm. <laughs> no, go ahead. All right. Go on. That I will support and defend. That I will support, that I will and, support and defend. And defend. I'm trying to get a rhythm. <laughs> the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution, the Constitution of, the United, of States. the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution, and the Constitution, of, the Constitution of, of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against, against all, all enemies, enemies foreign, foreign and, and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance. That I will bear, I will true, bear true faith, faith, and, true allegiance. faith and allegiance. To the Constitution of the United States. To the Constitution of the United, 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 United States. States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. I take this obligation freely. freely. I, take I take this, this obligation, obligation freely. freely. Without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without any without mental evasion or purpose, or purpose of, evasion. of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. And that, and that I, I will well and faithfully, and faithfully discharge, discharge, duties, the discharge the duties. Upon which I am about to enter. Upon, upon which I am about, about, to, enter. about to enter. Thank you. I have one question. Since Jeff was on mute the entire time, does that matter? I saw his he couldn't moving. saying anything. <laughs> uh, you know. <laughs> well, he's going to take the oath again when we get together. So yeah. And you know, this looks very much like the oath I took in the army. So all right. I think it's Doubling my down. sixth. Okay. Well, with that uh, formality finished, then I would like to convene this meeting of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District um, for December 15th, 2022. Holly, would you take the roll, please? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Ackman. Here. Director Fultz. Here. Director Hill. Here. Director Smalley. Here. There he is. <laughs> You moved. Are there any additions and deletions to the closed session agenda? Rick. Uh, yes, uh, Chair Hood, uh, I would like to remove item 5B, uh, the 
public employee annual performance evaluation for district council. We have a lengthy closed session agenda tonight, and I would like to move this item uh, to a January uh, 2023 meeting. With if there's any objections, I, I agreed with as soon as I saw both the closed session and the regular session, we were going to be here till 10 o'clock and um, I'm getting too old for that. So uh, <laughs> uh, I think um, that's a good idea. All right, this is the uh, point in the meeting where we have uh, oral communications from members of the public regarding items in closed session. I don't see any attendees out there. So I guess uh, we will not have any public communication. So with that, we will adjourn to closed session. Okay. Are you ready? Yes, is everybody ready? Um, we will go ahead and reconvene um, this meeting. Um, Holly, would you take the roll, please? President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Ackerman. Here. Director Falls. Here. Director Hill. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Um, there is nothing to report. No actions were taken in the closed session. Um, the board did not complete the closed session agenda, so we'll reconvene after this open session to complete the closed session agenda. It will not reconvene again afterwards uh, for another open session because there will be no actions to report. Uh, there will only be discussions in the uh, closed session to follow this, this one. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? The staff has none, Chair. Okay. Um, this is the time for oral communications uh, from members of the public who would like to comment on issues within the purview of the district, but that are not on tonight's agenda. Would anybody like to comment? I see we have four attendees, but nobody has raised their hand. So I will, um, oh, okay. Uh, Jamie, you have your hand up. I do. I, I didn't know where it was appropriate for me to just let everyone know that I, I do unfortunately have to leave a little early tonight. So um, I will be departing at 730, but I actually will probably be able to come back for the closed session. So I don't know, Gina, if that's a an issue for me or not, if I have to step out of the meeting for a little while and then come back. Well, that's, that's permissible. We just need to record the time that you um, depart and return and whether you want your um, partial absence to be excused. I, I don't I don't really think it's a critical issue. It, I, I think we can follow that. I'm, I'm just going to rule that stepping out for a short meeting does not constitute an absence. So she's been, she'll be here by the both of it, and that's good enough. Um, <laughs> all right, so on, on to the president's report. I just want to report that... Um, uh, yesterday, the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency submitted a $2.6 million grant proposal to the Department of Water Resources um, for implementing uh, projects in the groundwater sustainability plan. And this is the one the board heard about at its last meeting. It includes about $300,000 to advance conjunctive use and our access to our Loch Lomond um, allocation, as well as in addition, funding for ongoing monitoring um, activities of groundwater wells, stream water, and other things that were um, sort of mandated and committed by the Sustainable Groundwater Act to uh, do. I want to thank Carly for her efforts in uh, being our, our representative on developing this. Um, and we're keep, keeping our fingers crossed uh, when the awards are announced um, in June. Um, that will get a favorable response. Um, I'd also like to take a moment of personal privilege here, because this will be uh, the last president report that I have um, of this term, and, um, and we'll be turning over to a new president. And so I just want to say that for the last two years, I've been honored to preside over 
um, these board meetings. Um, and I would like to thank um, Rick and Gina and Holly, who I think initially had to make some um, adjustments because maybe I was a little bit more hands-on and assertive than some of the previous uh, chairs were, and, and the rest of the staff too. I can see Carly smiling out there. <laughs> and um, I appreciate how you all did it so very graciously. And I'm especially indebted to Gina because my first few months as I kind of got up to speed and figured out how things worked um, were, were pretty rocky and um, she saw me uh, through it. Um, and so I really uh, appreciate that. Um, I think that over these two years, we've seen an increasing um, professionalism in the level of the, the board. And um, I, I guess I especially want to comment now, since basically the, the gang's all back together, people were elected or reelected, and um, to express my optimism for the upcoming term, because I think that, you know, that especially over the last number of months, we've really, um, I think, have worked really well together. We often disagree about things. Uh, we don't agree on everything, but I think there's a level of mutual respect that allows us um, to get uh, work work done and get it done expeditiously. So I um, I just want to express that optimism and um, to thank the rest of the board for making these um, last little bits of me being president um, very enjoyable in, in that regard. So with that, we will go on to um, there is no unfinished business. And under new business, it is uh, my last uh, duty as president to um, entertain nominations for president and vice president. And once we elect them, um, we will, uh, I will basically turn over the virtual gavel to the new president. Uh, Jamie, do you have your hand up? I do, I wanted to make a nomination. Okay, go ahead. Um, I have really enjoyed being vice chair and um, I, I, you know, I'm thrilled to, that we're going to be continuing as as a group that I think has has um, really worked well together, as Gail said, to be uh, you know to be civil, to find solutions, and be a more professional board than perhaps the water district had in the past. Um, I, uh, as vice chair, um, I, I don't know if I would have received any nominations for chair, but um, if I would have, I probably would have had to really politely decline because I'm just going to have a really busy year in front of me professionally. And um, so I wanted to make a nomination for Mark Smalley because I think that he would be an excellent board chair. I think he has been incredibly pivotal in some really important conversations with our community. Um, and I think that as board chair, he can continue that work. So um, that's my nomination for chair. Okay. Is there a second? I second that. Okay. We have a, a nomination and a second. Um, so we can now have any discussion by members uh, of, of the board. Would anybody like to discuss this? Bob? No, no thank you. Okay. Mark? Uh, no, thank you. Okay. Well, you, it might be worthwhile to say that you were, you will, uh, if nominated, you're willing to oh, do it. <laughs> I, I, uh, yes, I'm, I'm willing to fill this role. Thank you. Thank you. If, if, if nominated, I shall not I run. Serve. If elected, I shall not serve. <laughs> I'm, thank you. Right. Okay, I got the quote wrong. Right. Thank you, Bob, for fixing that. Okay. Then, um, uh, I, I think Mark would do a great, great job. So I, um, but like, now I would like to go out to members of the um, public. Are there any members of the public that would like to comment on this? Alina. Let, okay, you're, you're, uh, you're okay. Go ahead. I, just, I just wanted to say that I completely agree with this and working with Mark Smalley, uh, the past two years on the engineering and environmental committee has just been um, an amazing experience. And I think he's a wonderful leader and I would really like to see him in this role. Thank you for that nice vote of confidence, Alina. Um, any other comments from the member of uh, the public? Okay, um, with that, let's 
Uh, go ahead and take a roll call vote. President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackman. Yes. Director Falls. Yes. Director Hill. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. It's unanimous. All right. Um, next, we uh, elect a vice president. And I, I don't know how far this tradition goes back, but in general, at least when, when I've watched it for the last about four years, it was the president was sort of allowed to express a preference uh, for who they might want to be vice president. Um, and so I would like to give Mark that opportunity. Okay. Um, I've had uh, contact with all of the board members for the last, uh, what, uh, eight months now that uh, Mr. Hill is our most recent board member. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, Jeff thinks a lot like I do, and I would like to nominate uh, Jeff Hill for vice president. I'll second that. And I will accept the nomination. <laughs> All right. Any other comments by members of the board? Okay. How about members of the public? Um, sorry, Gail. Oh, I'm sorry. Wouldn't, wouldn't Mark be um, conducting that this? Sorry, I don't no, mean to No, no, I turn it over this, um, after this is done. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, members of the public? I don't see any hands up. So, uh, Holly, could you go ahead and take a roll call vote, please? President May. Aye. Vice President Ackman. Yes. Director yes. Falls. Yes. Director Hill. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. And with that, I. Happily turn over the virtual gavel to you, Mark. Okay. Uh, it's going to be a rocky one tonight, then, since <laughs> this is uh, new to me. Um, and if, let's if see. Let me chair Smalley. Um, I will be a little more hands on in this meeting than I might typically, uh, and I'm, I hope you'll excuse it. <laughs> Uh, I'm I'm uh, welcoming that assistance, Gina. Um, and one other thing, um, I prefer Mark. Leave it at that. Got it. So, thank you. Thank you. Um, okay. The uh, next item uh, on the agenda is the uh, annual comprehensive financial report, um, and. Uh, I'll turn that over to, to Rick. Are you leading that? Ms. I will be uh, asking uh, the finance manager to present uh, the uh, memo to the board. And I do believe we have representatives from um, our audit service here tonight as well. So we've got Kendra. Yes. Okay. Uh, mean everyone, district staff with the assistance of our auditors prepared an annual comprehensive financial report for fiscal year 21-22 in accordance with guidelines established by the Government Finance Officers Association and generally accepted accounting standards and principles. Tonight, we have Jonathan Abadesco with Fidoc and Brown, our audit firm, to present the financial statements for fiscal year 2021 and 2022. Uh, it is recommended that the Board of Directors review this memo, receive the presentation from the firm Fidoc and Brown, and approve the SLVWD financial statements for fiscal year 2021-2022. And with that, I will hand it over to Jonathan for his presentation. Yeah, Kendra, thanks for that uh, nice uh, introduction. So with further ado, um, on behalf of our firm, I'm, I'll, I'm, here, I'm here to present tonight the uh, financial statements or audited statements for fiscal year 22 for the district. I will share my screen. Okay. 
Can you all see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so, so the firm issued an unmodified or clean opinion where the financial statements of the district is in compliance with US generally accepted accounting principles or, or, or GAAP. So the next two slides will show the uh, financial highlights of the district. The first that is shown on the screen is your uh, statements of net position or your balance sheet. So I just wanted to point it out that uh, your total net position increased by $2.8 million as a result of your ongoing operations, okay? So, okay, so this next slide is your income statement or the statement of revenues, expenses, or changes in your net position. So, so this slide shows you that uh, the total revenues of the district decreased by $2 million as shown in the screen, which is primarily due to your um, capital grants decreasing by $2.6 million and your, uh, which was offset by your total operating revenues increasing by $770,000, okay? So moving along. So do you have any questions so far with the report? Um, Jonathan, if you'll go through the entire report, and then we can come back to questions uh, on any of the specific pages after you conclude. Yeah, thank you, President Somali. Oh. Or Mark, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So this slide will show your total expenses for the year where there was a decrease in your total expenses of $840,000 which can be attributed to your salaries and benefits, uh, decreasing uh, by about uh, $730,000, and your professional services decreasing by $240,000. Okay. Also on your board, board packet, I believe, there, there's a management report that was issued to the board and the management report only concludes that uh, we don't have any difficulties in performing our audit test work. We don't have any disagreements with management and we did not consult with other outside CPAs or independent accountants. Also, when we perform our audit test work, we did not find any material weakness or any significant deficiencies in, in your controls. So I just wanna commend uh, the district's team from uh, Rick, um, I'm down the line to all the staff. You all did a great job. Um, your controls are operating as intended. So, okay. So in summary, The district received an unmodified or clean opinion. Your net position, it increased by $2.8 million. And your total revenues, it decreased by $2 million. And your total expense increased by, uh, sorry, decreased by um, $840,000. And that concludes my uh, presentation for um, tonight. Any questions that the board may have, I'll be happy to answer those. Okay, um, let's go through questions. Um, Jeff? Um, 
I had one question. If you could go back one slide. One slide. Okay. There's a, there's a lot of numbers here, and, and you know it's hard to deal with large numbers of numbers in a presentation like this. But where you have the net position increasing by two million eight hundred twenty eight thousand as a result of ongoing operations, and then the revenues decreasing largely because of a decrease in capital contribution. Mm -hmm. That basically appears to be a swing of about $4 million. Am I understanding that correctly? Um, not necessarily, because uh, this net position is your ending net position. OK, so that's all in, in the net position then? Yes, uh -huh. I agree. OK. That's it, Jeff. That's that's a, that's it at this point. Okay. And I, there's okay. a lot of numbers here, and, and digging through them one by one is going to be difficult. But okay. Uh, Bob, question. Yeah, Jeff. thanks. Yeah, just just a few things. I mean, Jeff, you know the net position. Um, if you're used to dealing as I am with regular yeah. finances, it's a very strange concept. I, I tend to focus more on operating margins and non-operating margins and total margins. And that's not really part of this um, report. Um, and so just you know, quick calculation because, because of the increase in revenues and the decrease, significant decrease in operating expenses, which is really uh, nice to see. Our operating margin looks to be close to 3.6 million. Uh, non-operating margin about a half million. So together that's the 4 million in total margin, which would be, um, you know, pretty significant. Um, you know, in 2017, the rate increase was done in such a way to try to target 3 million in operating margin um, that could be applied to capital expenses based on the estimates that were in place at that time that the district needed to spend about $3 million in, in capital to stay even. Um, and, and that's kind of how that those numbers came about. Um, so, I mean, I'd like to see operating margin in these, but I know it's not really part of their remit. Uh, maybe in the future, it could be part of the supplemental information, but um, you know, it, it is what it is. The other thing about the the documents, which I think are very clear and and do present you know um, good information as far as it goes, is it doesn't delve deeply into all of the um, unfunded liabilities that we have, some of which are off books, um, particularly our tanks, tank maintenance, and that sort of thing, which are in the millions of dollars, potentially upwards of ten million if you include tank replacements. Um, th th this is a significant amount of money that somehow we need to start capturing in uh, the financial statements uh, that we have uh, so that we're dealing with some of this off balance sheet um, type thing. I did have a couple of questions. Let me just pull up the document. Um, try to get to the right place. If, if we could go to note eight on the defined pension uh, defined benefit pension plan. Um, I just had a comment there that it looked like our um, pension uh, liability went down significantly. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming after looking at CalPERS website that that was based on the fact that the stock market did really well in 2020 and 2021 up to the point of June for both of those years. Mm -hmm. um, is that a fair uh, statement? Yes, uh, Director Phelps, uh, that's a fair statement. Actually, with CalPERS, um, their, their uh, measurement date is uh, they're using the June 30th, 2021 numbers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So last year, the entire Cal CalPERS pool, they, uh, they earned $4 billion in investment income. Yeah, no, in 2020 and 2021 were really good. Yes. 2022, uh -huh. on the other hand, um, you know, there was a negative year as it was, I think, for everybody, certainly for yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. um, and the funded status went from what I think the peak almost ever of 82% down to 71%. So 
I'm, I'm expecting that these numbers may um, uh, creep back up, um, but it would certainly be nice while it is at this level to see if we can whack away at that some more because I'm, I really don't like paying their uh, loan sharking interest fees on the outstanding liability uh, that we have. Um, question I had about on page, um, it's still in note eight, but it's the last part of note eight. Um, uh, I wasn't sure I understood the difference in the two tables on page. Uh, um, it's got 85, 53, and 79 of 124. So take, uh, so, take your choice. So which page? Is it uh, page 53? Uh, yeah, it'd be 53. That, that's a good number. Ah, okay. So, yeah, so there's, yeah. there's two tables here that talk about the district's net pension liability. Mm -hmm. And they have, of course, uh, vastly different numbers. Okay, so if you're looking at uh, page... 53. Let me show you that page. Hold on. I will show you that page. I'm assuming it's just a difference in time. So it's just a page that uh, you were looking at? Yes. Okay, so this, uh, this is a required uh, disclosure by GASB 68, where it wanted to show the readers for example, um, that what will happen if the the current discount rate of uh, seven point fifteen percent is brought down by uh, minus one percent? So it so it just signifies that uh, it will your net pension liability will increase by to three point nine million dollars. However, if um, the discount rate will jump to a plus 1%, it will be a net pension asset. I understand. I'm, I guess if we could get 8% every year, that would be really great. I'm not necessarily expecting that. Okay, so basically this is a sensitivity analysis on the current pension uh, liability, looking at what happens in either direction if things get better or worse. Yes. Okay. And, uh, and I like your analysis, Director Falls. Uh, Thank you for bringing this up uh, because you are the first one, I think, from all the presentations I have that brought this page up. So thank you. Oh, well, okay. I, I, lo I look for unfunded liabilities, so um, just my financial nature. Okay, yeah. let me go back to, thank you. Uh, let me go back to the next one. Okay, we got that. Um, this one's just a comment for the board and the community. It, it's in the supplemental information. But I did want to point out that between 2021 and 2022, um, the water sales um, went down substantially. I think, as we all know, 10% down. So what that means is that our community, uh, unfortunately, we're almost off the um, uh, page in terms of the peak usage. But if you go back to 2013 and 2014, particularly 2014, when we used almost when we sold almost 2,000 acre feet, uh, we're down under um, right around 1,400. You know that's a significant. That's more than 25 percent drop. Um, and I think that reflects the fact that our community, when asked to conserve water, um, you know, does a really good job. Um, I think you can also see from the numbers that. Um, when it goes down, it kind of only creeps back up a little bit. So uh, depending on how we're doing our forecasting going forward, um, I'm not sure that we can necessarily guarantee that we're going to pop back up into the 1600s, um, you know, right away. It, it may take a while to get there. Um, and so I think that has substantial implications for um, rates historically over the last five years that have been more volumetric based rather than fixed charge based. Um, and uh, basically in terms of what has to be charged, if you want to continue to maintain the operating margins necessary to address the um, uh, district's capital infrastructure, along with, of course, operating expenses. 
So uh, congratulations to the community. Good job in saving money or saving water. Um, but it also does have a financial impact to the owners of the district as well in their role as owner. And uh, Director Fultz, um, I just want to comment about the uh, operating margin. I think in uh, maybe for next year, we can consider adding a table or historical table in the uh, stat section. Yeah, that, that would be really great. Yeah, Thank we will you. do that, you know? Okay. Oh. Well, I mean, it's not just because I'm asking for it. It would only be if the board, you know, as a whole thinks it has any value. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah so please let me know so that uh, we know what direction to take for the future um, act for. Great. Well, thank you for putting this together. Um, before we move on, I wanted to uh, conclude on that uh, offer to include that uh, additional table on the operating expenses. Uh, I think I saw Jeff's thumb up on that. Am I oh, correct, yes, Jeff? I, I agree with uh, Bob on that. We, okay. we definitely need then, to have uh, operating margins looked at. Okay. And I would like to see that in there also. So. Uh, right. And if we could include non-operating margins as well, that would be fabulous. Okay. Yes, uh, Mark, Jeff, uh, Bob. We will definitely okay. have you do that. So. Okay. Thank okay. You. Um, okay. Um, other uh, director's comments? Uh, Jamie? No, thank you. I will give it to our financial reform board. Okay. Um, Gail? Uh, no, I don't think I have anything to add. Okay. Um, I if I, if I may just, were you about to go out to the public? Uh, not quite yet, Gina. I have a question, and then I wanted to uh, at least point out the motion that's in front of us before we go out to the public. Got it. Thank you. If I may um, I, interject just before you go out to the, the public, I appreciate it. Okay. All right. Sure. Um, Jonathan, on page, I believe it's six of your, um, no, I'm it's the financial highlights um, in your section. On um, um, my uh, presentation? On your presentation, yes. Um, where we see the uh, capital contributions dropping um, by an order of magnitude from 2021 to 2022, uh, being a, a little more than 3 million mm -hmm. um, in, uh, yes. The capital grants, yeah, a little more than three million in twenty one, and just under four hundred thousand in twenty two. Um, what's the significant uh, grant that's part of this? Uh, this is related to the uh, FEMA grant that uh, was received by the district related to the okay. uh, fire. Okay. All right, so that's um, the, the FEMA is the reimbursable amounts that we're getting on uh, projects where we've already incurred that? Is that? Uh, yes, I believe uh, this this uh, mm -hmm. revenue was already uh, right. incurred by the district. Uh, Mark, I can jump in here. Um, Please, Kendra. So Back at last fiscal year for fiscal year 21, those are the expenses that we incurred that we intend to submit to FEMA for reimbursement. Um, so we had to book it on our books as uh, the revenue earned. And the offset to that was we uh, created a grant receivable account that's on the balance sheet now. So once we start uh, receiving those funds, for the expenses that we've already incurred, uh, it'll just okay. reduce the grant receivable account. Um, and then the 397,000 includes uh, expenses that we incurred for FEMA related projects in the current year. If that helped explain. Yes, your yeah, okay. that, 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 that explains it for me. Okay. okay, thank you, thank you. Yeah, Kendra, um, thanks for confirming my uh, assertion a while ago. 
Thank you. Okay, that's the questions that I have. Uh, before we go out to the public for uh, comments, um, I do want to um, put the motion that we have in front of the board so that the public understands what that is in the event that they haven't seen this. Um, that the board uh, review the presentation, uh, receive that, and approve of that um, for the fiscal year 21-22. Mark, are you are you making a motion, or are you um, just explaining? Yes, yes, yes. I would yes, I would like to make that motion, but not vote on it yet until we go up to the public for comments. So I can second that. Okay, thank you, Bob. Okay. Uh, Gina, you said that you wanted to do comment before we go out to the public. If I may, thank you. I, um, I, I just wanted to, Mark, since you're the new chairman, and I, and I know you're going to develop your own sort of style for handling public comments, um, but just a quick reminder that the best practice consistent with the board policy manual would be to give each member of the public who wants to speak uh, the, the three minutes, um, unless you decide in advance to make it longer or shorter. Um, let everybody speak once and then close public comments and determine which items, if any, from the public comments you as chairperson want to direct to staff or the consultants for follow-up, you know, rather than engaging in kind of a back and forth during the public comment period uh, would be the typical right. approach. Okay. All right. Um, and without having thought of any other plan. Yes, that's what we're going to do tonight. So thank you, Gina. Uh, the three minutes uh, um, is something that we've used in the past and uh, we will continue. So um, comments from the public. Uh, I see Cynthia, Cynthia. Good evening. I just have a quick question. I think it was a page labeled section four that we just looked at uh, that had water produced and water sales for each year. And then another column said water losses. Are those losses due to leaks? What are those losses due to? Because I understand it must be the difference between water produced and water sold. So if I may ask you, uh, Cynthia, so what page are you uh, looking at? It was two or three slides back. Ah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure Jonathan is the right one to answer. I can, but, I can answer that question. Thank you, Rick. Please go ahead. I think this, this is, is a- This is James. Sort of, James. Uh, so the water losses is flushing and leaks throughout the year. That's what those okay. total, total gallons for water loss is leaks and flushing. Okay. Um, it was 27%, I believe, on the last year recorded. Could you show that slide? And does that seem unusual? Um, not, it's not, not really unusual, no. Not for us. Right. Not for us. <laughs> Not for most water districts. Yes. It depends on the state of your district. We have old infrastructure. I have to agree. Okay. Um, moving on then. Uh, Bruce Holloway. Uh, can you hear me? We can, Bruce. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, I really only had one particular question about the, there's a, on page 43, um, there's a note six is talking about a certificate of participation. And I discovered this, I guess, in the summer. And so when I, I was, in the summer, I was referring to the previous uh, financial statement. And the same note has been there for three years. This is the third year. Um, anyway, this description in the very first sentence where it says a rate ranging from 4% to 5%, 
um, that does not fit the table. And um, eventually, uh, this morning, I got a look at the loan document, and I would characterize this differently. Uh, I wouldn't say four to five percent. I would probably say more like three to four percent. Um, but actually, what I would think would be the best would be to say that it started at three and three quarters, and it goes down to three percent. Um, so this particular detail about the four percent to five percent, I don't know where that came from, but it does not match the. It does not fit the the table that's right there. Uh, can I answer that uh, question? Please, please, Jonathan, yes. Okay, so, uh, yeah, Bruce, so what you're referring to um, about this note is uh, we have reviewed again the documents this morning, the loan, and uh, the rate should be uh, from 3% to 5%. So let me show you that screen, okay? So... Hold on. Let me go back to the screen. Let me share with that screen. Crystal, can you see uh, this uh, screen? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So well, this, this is from the trust agreement. And uh, it says, um, you know, so from the lower 3% to 5%. That doesn't go with those, well, the table that's in the note that shows the actual number of dollars every year, mm -hmm. this doesn't correspond. This doesn't correspond to the the, uh, the schedule of payments. And in, what I'm particularly interested in is, is this year and the next five years, I think it would be fair to say that the cost of this loan for the next five years is 3.6%. Um, so I think these descriptions that say four to five, or that if it was going to say three to five, I that does not give the information that somebody needs to know. And I want to point out that this it's a huge loan. Um, and so even though we're only talking about 1% or something, at 1% of a 14 million dollar loan, it's a lot of money every year. Um, and that's why I'm making an issue of this. I've struggled with it for quite a while since last summer. Um, all I can say is that the, the, the description there, the characterization from 4% to 5%, it does not fit the schedule of payments. And the schedule of payments appears to say 3.6% for the next five years. So, um, so regarding your assertion, I agree with you, but uh, for the disclosure of the financial statements, we only base off um, what is verbatimly stated on the uh, district's documents. So we cannot just uh, say that uh, based on the uh, debt schedule or based on our calculation, or the district's calculation that uh, the rates is decreasing from 5% to 3% or 4.1% to 3%. We cannot just say that. Because the reason why, because accounting standards or auditing standards requires us to make sure that uh, when we put something on the uh, financial statements, it's being corroborated by um, physical evidence, which is this. And this uh, 3% to 5%, this is the time that uh, where, or the rates that were prevailing and when you negotiated or signed for this loan way back in August, not one, August 1st of 2019 or 2019. So I think uh, what we have here is uh, based on the trust agreement, which is here. 
So I don't see any. Uh... Well, this table here that says 2049, and then there's six million dollars yeah. at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, that that does not fit the the schedule of payments that's in the note. The note doesn't say that. Uh, I guess I. <laughs> Every, uh, every Bruce, every amortization schedule, normally the interest rate um, will be will be higher in the first year, and it will go down to the to the, um, going down the line. No, no. If, if I'm sorry, but okay. I have to point out the other loan. There's another loan on there for 15 million dollars. It's called an installment purchase loan to America. Uh, the description of that one says 2.4 percent, and I understand perfectly. The other loan, the characterization of the other loan is just fine. It matches the table, the schedule of payments. I have no, no quarrel about the other loan. I'm only, uh, I only, and I've spent a lot of time and we've discussed this and I'm sorry to be taking so much of your time, but you, the note to say 4% to 5% is a mischaracterization of the, um, of, of, of the loan. So I'm going to stop it here, and um, uh, I I think that there's an inaccuracy, and I, and I don't know what else to say. Yeah, Bruce, I think uh, the other sure. loans, you know, um, the rates are, let's say, for example, for the Felton Safe Drinking Water Loan, those are, those um, are all consistent. And, and Mark, John, John, Jonathan, okay. um, I, I think that you've adequately explained it at this point, um, and... Bruce, I believe, has made his point on this, that he feels that that is incorrect. Um, I did see, uh, I believe, two of the directors looking to comment. Bob? Um, only, that I, only that I thought that we could probably take this uh, offline to staff, if you wished, if the board wished. Otherwise, I think we need to I, move on. I agree, and I think we should do that. So, Gail? I, I, I was simply going to say the same thing, and that I know okay. that uh, he's had extensive conversations back and forth with Rick Rogers about this exact thing. So um, this isn't a good use of board time. OK. Um, other members from the public that wish to comment on this? Um, I see that Cynthia has her hand up, but Cynthia, we've already heard from you once. So I'm looking for anybody else. If not, I don't see any other hands up. Um, I'd like to uh, go back to, um, oh, um, I'd like to go back to the motion then. Uh, Rick? I, I thought you were wrapping this item up. I just wanted to thank Kendra. This is her first audit, and she came straight back from from leave and 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 dove into this with the auditors, and she did a splendid job moving this ahead. I just wanted to thank her. Okay, Bob. And one comment, comment and one comment and one question. Uh, the comment was: I just wanted to remind the board and the community that. The top line revenue number for operating uh, revenue uh, has the um, CZU surcharge bundled into it, roughly $1 million. So when looking, and that money is not able to be used for anything outside of the CZU recovery. So um, when looking at the actual revenue number, you need to take a million off. Um, and, and that actually is relevant to getting to the operating margin because I view that 1 million as, even though I know technically accounting wise, it's part of the operating margin and it really isn't from the point of view of what, what we can do with it. Um, so that's something to keep in mind uh, for the future. I did want to ask a question about what accounted for the uh, reduction in operating expenses, which seemed to be pretty substantial between uh, 2021 and 2022. I will... Uh... Um, I think that either Rick or Kendra are probably the appropriate ones to yeah, address I, that I, question. I, yes, I agree. Kendra, do you want to go ahead? 
I do believe it was labor cost. Yeah, I'm sorry. Can Bob, can you repeat your question? Yeah, no worries. On the operating expenses, which went down substantially from 20, 2021 to 2022, I was wondering if you could characterize what the major uh, items were that accounted for that. Uh, the the major items in, with the difference between 2021 and 2022 uh, was a decrease in salaries because of our vacant positions and also a decrease in um, contract professional fees. And and what 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 accounted for the decrease in professional fees? What, what is it that we didn't do or that we did the year before? I'm, I'm trying to get a handle on what I believe I believe last year we had more CZU related expenses compared to this year. Um, I can delve into it more and get back to you on that's, the exact. Just just looking broadly, if, if you think that's what it is, that, that makes sense to me too. Um, yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, sorry, um, yeah, dear board members. So I was looking at the uh, working trial balance that we have from the district. So the other notable um, change was there was a uh, Calper pension adjustment based on the um, based on the entire pool, entire pool. So there was a decrease of about uh, four hundred eighty six thousand dollars in um, operating expenses because of that. Oh, that was due to not having to pay their uh, loan shark fee for the uh, outstanding balance. That's really great. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So that's the reason why uh, <laughs> the total net pension liability also decreased. So. Yeah. Right. No, I understand that 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 part. Great, because I think we pay like seven percent or something like that. Uh, of course, with inflation, maybe it's not so loan shark anymore. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, but next year uh, we anticipate. Oh, uh, oh yeah, um, we're gonna get big expenses. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Big time. Yep. Big time. Yeah. That's why it'd be great to try to figure out a way to get that number down lower. Okay. Great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, we do have a motion on the table in front of us. Um, any further comments from board members on that before we go out for take a vote on that? Seeing none, Holly, would you take a roll call vote? The motion. President, sure. President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Which is unmuted. Yes. Sorry. Director Ackerman. Yeah. Director Falls. Yes. Director Mayhood. Aye. Okay, motion passes unanimously. Um, moving on to the next item, uh, the committee appointments um, for public applicants in uh, 2023. Uh, Rick, uh, is anybody from the staff leading this or am I? Um, it's uh, pretty self-explanatory. Um, okay. Uh, as a per board policy, the committee appointments will be reviewed by the full board at a board of directors meeting in December of each calendar year, uh, or as soon as thereafter as practical. Uh, applicants to serve uh, as a public member will be available uh, at the district office, and they were available online. Public members applications will be reviewed by the full board. Each committee member shall be appointed by a simple majority of the board. Um, uh, the district's 2023 standing committees are the admin, two board members and three public members, budget and finance, two board members and three public members, engineering and environmental, two board members and three public members, and then the LADOC um, liaison, uh, one board liaison, and no more than five public members. So in your packet, you do have the, the applications uh, for uh, each of the committees. Um, we received eight applications for the committees, five are currently serving on committees, and three are new uh, applicants. We did not receive any applications for LADOC, and we'll address the LADOC committee later um, uh, at the beginning of next year. So that'll okay. turn it back to you, Chair. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, so for the admin committee, uh, we have uh, Amanda De Jesus. 
and Mark Dolson. Uh, for the Budget and Finance Committee, uh, James Ba, uh, Monica Martinez, and James Mosier. And then for the Engineering and Environmental Committee, Alina Lang, Michael Murphy, and Kevin O'Connor. Um, I wanted to see if uh, board members have any comments or questions on these. Uh, Gina has had her hand up for a while now, Mark. I think maybe oh, she wants okay. to say something. Okay. Thank you, Gail. I, I just wanted to make a process suggestion for this item, um, sure. which is that um, it's typical uh, to let those committee applicants um, who are present for the meeting to introduce themselves prior to board discussion. Of course, you don't have to do it that way, um, but, but that's a common approach. And then when we get to the stage of making a motion um, to, 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 to vote, there is a couple of different ways to do it. You could vote committee by committee, or you could do the entire slate of candidates. Um, which may be easy enough here given um, the number of applicants, but it is important to clarify in the motion how many members there will be on each committee um, with the appointments. So uh, just for example, if the motion were to appoint uh, you know, all of the public applicants to the admin budget finance and uh, engineering environmental committee, it would also need to state that that will make uh, for the number of the admin committee four, the number of budget and finance five, and the number of engineering and environmental five. Okay, thank you. So uh, I will take your suggestion then uh, to go out to uh, members of the public who um, have submitted applications um, to see if they want to uh, say anything about themselves, and I see that we have uh, two. Uh, Mark Dolson, would you like to uh, either introduce yourself or provide any information to us? Hi, am I unmuted now? You are. Yes. Thank you. I'm applying to serve my uh, third consecutive year on the admin committee. And um, I think my application speaks for itself. I don't know that I want to take up any more of the board's time right now. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Um, Alina, I see that you're on also. Uh, would you like to offer any comments? Oh, I, I wasn't expecting to speak tonight, but yeah, I'm Alina Lang, and I've been serving for the, the past two years, and I would like to continue uh, for for a third year on the environmental and engineering uh, committee, you know I have attended every meeting and I'm committed to this position, and I feel that my environmental background will continue to serve this committee well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so um, I see uh, a couple of board members. Uh, Gail. Yes, I'd like to make a motion. Um, okay. I would like to move uh, that, well, first let me just preface it by saying that um, basically the, as it's stated in the memo from staff, we've appointed uh, everybody to their first choice uh, committee, which seems like the logical thing to do. Um, and everybody that's applied has been given a position and I've read all of their uh, CVs and they're all well qualified. So I think we're lucky to have them all. So I'm going to formally uh, move that we appoint Amanda De Jesus and Mark Dolson to the admin committee and that the admin committee is constituted by four members, that we appoint James Bond, Monica Martinez, and Jim Mosher to the budget and finance committee and it's constituted by three, uh, five members, and that we appoint Alina Lang, Michael Murphy, and Kevin McConnor to the engineering and environmental committee and that that committee consists of five members. Okay. Um, before I go out for any other public comments, do we have a second on that motion? Second. Okay. Thank you, Bob. Um, any uh, 
members of the public with comments on that? I see that, uh, I see none. Okay. Well, Wait, uh, Mark, Mark Lee's hand has gone up and then come down. It might be oh, okay. whether or okay. not. Okay. Mr. Lee, do you have comments on this? Uh, um, the appointments yes, that we're making? I support the uh, motion. I think all the candidates are excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Okay. Uh, I also want to express my appreciation for uh, the members of the public that are willing to do this. Thank you. Um, and particularly those that have served for several years for us already and are willing to continue to do that. I'm grateful. Uh, Bob, did you have another comment on this before we? Yeah, I, I just wanted to comment since since um, 2018 when we instituted moving from one public member to multiple, um, we've seen a tremendous increase in uh, the participation, the skill sets, the energy that has been brought to the committees. And uh, I think it's been great. And I really want to thank everybody that's served um, in the past year and uh, willing to re-up for another year, as well as the new mem committee members. I think it's a great way to get uh, much more public participation in an agency that um, they're co-owners of, frankly. Um, so thank you all for doing that. Okay, uh, Jamie. Um, I wanted to add my thanks and also to say that uh, in particular, I think the admin committee is really fortunate. Um, even though we are small, we are mighty. Amanda and, and Mark are great and really dedicated um, uh, uh, public committee members and are so thoughtful about the issues that we have in front of us. And I, I just wanted to um, also thank Mark because he's taken up the recent role of um, doing some writing about water district issues um, locally. And I, I think that that's really just a, an important thing that he's doing. So um, I'm excited that they are going to continue on. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, uh, Holly, would you take a roll call vote for us um, that we approve all of these um, applicants? President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackerman? Yes. Director Falls? Yes. Director Mayhood? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, uh, moving on to the next item. Um, the uh, peer review of the cross-country pipeline constructability study. Um, Rick? Um, uh, Josh, will the district engineer will start this off and then I will probably uh, come in with, with a recommendation. Um, go ahead, Josh. Okay. And okay, before we do that, I need to step away from the camera for two minutes and I will be back. But uh, I've heard a lot of this at the Engineering and Environmental Committee meeting. So, Josh, please proceed. As you wish. So, the peer review of the five mile cross-country pipeline constructability study has been received from Harrow and Kasunich. The peer review was intended to go through the rather lengthy constructability study with an eye towards ground truthing, essentially. Um, the idea being that, the idea being that with any large professional study, more eyes are better. And in this case, we were privileged to have access to the eyes and brains of John Kasunich and Mark Fox, who really are just the cream, the creme de la creme for people who know about the geological conditions in the Santa Cruz Mountains and specifically on Ben Lomond Mountain. As a point of reference, John Kasunich was the geotechnical engineer who did the geotechnical investigation for the original construction of the raw water pipelines. So he is, he's the pro from Dover, as they say. Currently, the 
peer review has been presented to the engineering committee and discussed there. In that discussion, uh, one specific question came up that I would like to address sort of preemptively here, which is the question of should Freyer and Loretta, who prepared the original constructability study, have done more in terms of survey? And the thing I would say is that, as we discussed in the engineering committee, Freyer and Loretta performed survey appropriate to the scope which we asked them to perform. The additional work that is needed was described in the constructability study by Freire and Loretta, who said the next step needs to be, we have to learn more about the exact conditions moving from constructability or can we do this into design or should we do this? With that, I have prepared the memo, which is in the board packet, along with presenting the peer review, and I'm asking that the board of directors review and accept the peer review and instruct staff to proceed with the next steps outlined in the memo. With that, I will take questions. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Um, as the chair of the Engineering and Environmental Committee, uh, I do want to reflect on uh, the committee uh, discussed this report uh, at some length for over an hour um, earlier this week, and uh, we agreed that the that this uh, peer review should be forwarded to the board for discussion here at this meeting. Um, there was some uh, discussion about the uh, next steps that are listed in here, and on whether we. Uh, should be proceeding on all of those now, uh, but I don't want to go into uh, that at this point, uh, just that we did not uh, concur on all of the recommendations that were uh, listed there. So with that, um, I'd like to open it up to uh, uh, questions, comments from the board. Uh, Bob, as the other in, as the other member of the e, &E committee, uh, I'd like to Get your thoughts first. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I'm more of a recovering engineer than an engineer. Um, so I, I guess on reflection after the discussion, I, I kind of viewed this, I guess, not so much as a formal peer review, but but a peer review with some augmentation, right? It, it seemed to me that the biggest difference between what FNL focused on and HKA had to do with the level of detail on the on the on the survey and the and the more quantitative analysis of the slopes that um, that mm -hmm. are, are there. I, I think there was one other um, major difference, but it it slips my mind right now what what that was. Um, but by and large, it seemed like outside of that the conclusion of HKA was, you know, similar to that of, of FNL that, you know, this, that there's work to be done, but, you know, definitely feasible to proceed, though perhaps with um, more consulting work, more engineering work up front, because the regulatory environment and environmental um, requirements have certainly changed from when the pipeline was originally constructed. Um, with respect to the recommendations, I, again, on reflection from uh, the meeting earlier this week, you know, I really want us to think about focusing um, moving forward as rapidly as possible on the Peavine um, reconstruction, recognizing that, that the Clear Creek and, and Sweetwater may take a little bit longer. Um, and by getting Peavine back online, I think we get ourselves up to, is it 60% of capacity, Rick, 55, somewhere in there. Um, whereas I think with Foreman, we're at about 35 to 40, somewhere in there, if you look at historical, um, historical trends. So, um, it, and by the way, it doesn't mean we can't move on them in parallel, but, but Peavine definitely needs to have, I think, more focus because I think the issues with Peavine are, are are less than with Clear Creek and, and Sweetwater. 
Uh, but yeah, outside of that, I thought um, HK did a great job. I, I thought it was a great augmentation of F and L. I, I hope they view it as a constructive addition to what they did uh, as more of a collaboration rather than a competition, anything like that. Because I think they both uh, made great contributions to what we need to do, which is um, get this pipeline rebuilt. I also didn't see anything in there, though, that dissuaded me from what I believe is the right thing to do, which is uh, burying the pipe uh, as absolute much as possible. And if we can't do that, then we need to use pipe that is not going to interject the VOCs in the event of another fire. Thanks. Okay. Um, other comments? Uh, Gail? Yeah. Um, I, I was very glad to read this report. Um, I, I thought that, the, as Bob said, the greater detail and the, the more quantitative efforts, and especially when it comes to actually drawing the cross-sections to scale so that you can really see uh, what the slopes look like and the amount of fill that would be moved around and what would happen to the retaining walls. And um, so I, I think that um, the main thing that I didn't like about the previous report um, was that I thought that it greatly underestimated the uh, difficulties that were going to be found with maintaining the benches um, because the Ben Lomond fault zone is right there. Um, the sedimentary rocks um, are just shot full of landslides. And so anytime you do any cut that is more than a few feet uh, tall in on the side of Ben Lomond Mountain, you're in the position of triggering more landslides. And I guess the most um, poignant example of that is the failure of the road, the Lion Tank, which I went up there when I was first appointed to the engineering committee. And it was immediately apparent that the landslide that happened there had actually been triggered by the road cuts that had been constructed to build the road in there because they built it on an old landslide and it failed. Um, and if they hadn't messed with that slope, it probably would still be there. So my, my concern was that I thought they were grossly underestimating the slope stability problems. And then on the other hand, in the so-called basement rocks, that is the granitic and the uh, metamorphic rocks, the cost that there would be of excavating a 12-foot uh, bench was going to be a lot um, in, in the harder rocks. So I, I was, you know, I, I just, I just came away with thinking that what they were advocating was going to be very difficult for us to maintain in the long in the long term. And it also was going to expose us to liability issues because if we have landslides that go into creeks and then turn into debris flows and end up um, in people's backyards um, down near Highway 9, um, it would not be a good thing. So um, I greatly appreciated uh, this report, which I thought was uh, much more detailed. and and. You're right, Bob, in the sense that um, they are complementary in a sense, because I thought that the previous one is essentially advocating that we do something that was going to cost 50 or $60 million or something like that. And this is, and I suspect is going to cost us a whole lot of money and consultants to try to explain to us how we're going to actually um, get vehicles and um, excavation uh, devices and things into these areas that are hard of access and to choke points. So I come away with thinking that although, um, you know, intuitively it seems more sensible to uh, bury the pipe, um, and maybe we should in those areas where the slopes are small enough that the amount of material that we move around is not too great, and that might be the case, for example, at Peavine. On the steep slopes, the environmental damage um, that we would do and the cost would be would not justify it. That's all. Okay. Uh, Jeff, questions, comments? Also, just a sec here. So I um, listened in on the uh, the engineering environmental committee meeting, as you know. 
And um, I was impressed by the level of the discussion and the um, pointed questions that were raised uh, in the whole process. Um, I agree with what I've heard here tonight also that this study is far more detailed about the exact locations and the problems that will be run into. I, I always had the feeling that the first one was sort of, you know, textbook stuff rather than what's really out there on the hillside. Um, and I do think we need to proceed with this. Uh, the clock is ticking. And I, I think we need to proceed, and I think we need to proceed in steps. And I'm, I'm not sure that I'm qualified to say which of these steps in this memo are, uh, you know, what, what the sequence is, but they make sense. And I think we need to get some people out there on site who actually are in the construction business who will, would be doing some of this uh, and have practical experience in how do you get out there and get get the equipment in there and how do you dig these trenches and stuff like that and get some opinions from that type of uh, expert. And uh, generally, I think this was a good move. We have a much better understanding of what we're faced with here, and I think we need to move forward. Okay. Um, I agree that this report was... Uh, more detailed in a number of areas than what we saw from Prayer and Loretta. Um, in particular, I focused in on the comments related to steep slopes and choke points, mm -hmm. um, with the those two being emphasized a number of times in there, and the need to figure out how to get um, pipeline past those areas. Um, and in and equipment also, if we're taking equipment in there in an attempt to either uh, bury or otherwise uh, be able to work with that pipe. Um, <clears throat> and I understand from the uh, discussion at the e, e committee meeting with Josh that the aspects of uh, getting either contractor input or input in the field from engineering firms or other experts um, was something that you were uh, capturing under a couple of the bullets on your next steps. Am I correct in that, Josh? Yes, that is correct. Okay. Uh, and specifically, uh, the prepare the RFP for the survey of the pipe alignment and prepare the opinion of probable cost um, as defined by the study. I think that those were the two where you were uh, uh, trying to, to, to capture other experts' input. Is that, that is correct. The intent was that those would happen sequentially, first determining, first completing the survey, then as part of preparing the opinion of probable cost, get construction professionals experienced in building on the side of the hill in with the survey in front of them as well. Okay. Okay. Um, the, the one uh, task or next step on here that I can't agree with at this point is the um, RFQ for the environmental impact report. Um, I strongly feel that we do not have um, a well enough defined project at this point and a project description um, for us to proceed with uh, soliciting environmental professionals at this point to do the EIR. Um, so with that, uh, I see that uh, Bob, you have some further comments. Just some thoughts about about this, um, and I'm sure Rick is going to have some as well. Um, 
you know, Mark and I walked about half of the Peavine uh, route um, before we turned around and went back. And I was actually surprised at how much of the bench was still there. I mean, there were places where it wasn't or wasn't enough, but a lot of places still had that. And it it seems like in talking with Rick that the Peavine um, route might be something that could be done faster. Is there a possibility, and this might be a question for Rick, of being able to look at these two and maybe parallel paths, but with with trying to get Peavine up and up and running faster. Um, and if that's the case, would a EIR on Peavine be appropriate and something that could be moved ahead faster? Whereas I think on Clear Creek and Sweetwater, and I'm with you, Mark, I'm, I'm kind of uncomfortable doing that at this point without more information about the survey to really inf inform that. I mean, it's almost like they need to be done in parallel, but I think the survey informs the EIR. Um, I, Rick, I don't know if that's possible, but you know, getting more surface water capacity back online faster is, is I think, really a paramount importance. Rick, you've had your hand up also in addition to the question that Bob's asking. Yeah. What comments do you, you want know, to offer us on this? I say I think I'm unmuted. Um, you know, definitely, I would like to have a goal of having Peavine back on uh, line uh, this summer. And that goal would be to replace P vine in kind, which is you know above ground the same way it was constructed. Um, you're not going to get enough to bury in my mind. And what you do bury will be a maintenance issue to keep it buried. And you will not keep it buried because maintenance up in the watershed, difficult to do. Um, there is no access. Um, given that, I would like to see us our next steps to continue with the, with the bullet points, put together a scope of work. The staff is still um, developing um, environmental review to the level that we believe it is needed. Um, we have meetings scheduled um, with our environmental consultants to discuss the level that's needed for Peavine. Um, we move on Peavine first and we follow back to back with the five mile. Five mile will be a much lengthier process because of the length of, of the pipe um, and the terrain. Um, but I, uh, I know the board has concerns, the biggest concerns, whether to bury or to uh, leave exposed. You're not gonna be able to protect that pipe. Uh, the VOCs will become an issue you're not going to get 100% uh, covered. You're not going to change the type of pipe from HDPE to a welded steel due to cost uh, installation and so forth. One thing that we need to do, we need to come back with uh, a scope, project scope, uh, a, uh, an outline of how we would like to proceed. We still need to consider having a public outreach session as we told our um, our consumers that we would bring this back uh, to make sure that the public had adequate time uh, to understand the project. So that's still another step in this. But I think uh, we need to move on this at a high priority and bring this back uh, through the engineering committee one more time and to the board with the uh, project scope and define the project, how it's going to be constructed, the stages that we're going to do, the steps, and a timeline and bring it back. But with uh, and for Peavine and above ground um, pipeline with HDPE and then get this one back online. So um, am I hearing you correct, Rick? Focus on Peavine. Focus our efforts on that at this point. Um, for whatever the next step is. There are five or six of them listed here in this memo, but focus on Peavine first. Um, okay. That's correct. And, you know, for the labor pool and so forth, we are discussing internally. Uh, we are looking at, at doing this pretty much as a district contractor project. Um. I understand. I've heard that 
in the E and E committee meeting. I don't know that the rest of the uh, directors have heard that other than Bob, but um, the the next step is for you to bring a uh, a proposal to to the either to the committee or to to the board on on what you think uh, you want to spend money on as far as the next step. So uh, I think. I think we can leave that with you. Um, I see that both Gail and Bob have their uh, hands up for further comments. I'd like to go to Gail first, and then I'll go I, back I to Bob. I just have a very quick question for Rick as background information is, do we know whether FEMA is willing to pay for um, something that's different than putting it back exactly the way it was? In other words, will they pay 90% towards burying the pipe? Because I mean, obviously, if they wouldn't, that like this this discussion is over, and we don't even need to go there. So, they, what do we know? We know that they will consider that. It, it they will not consider paying the full ninety percent of the cost of say just the burying. They'll pay ninety percent to replace the pipe and so forth, but the burying will be a different cost share, and it will take some time to get that determination out of FEMA. That would probably add considerable time onto the project for them to evaluate. We would probably most likely move ahead and do that and then roll the dice with FEMA and hope that they covered it because the time it would take to get the, an answer back from FEMA is considerable. But they look at the, the cost differential from putting it back the way it was to the new. So it was, it was $200 to bury and $100 uh, to put it in uh, the, the way it was, they will pay a percentage of that second $100. Not the 90%, but they will of the first part. Thank you. Okay. Bob? Yeah, I might be a minority in this, but I'm not prepared to move forward on above ground. Um, uh, for P vine. Um, I think the notion of protect, I mean, we we did protect and bury the foreman recline, right? Correct. We did. And, yeah. and I think the I think the uh, the notion of at this point getting somewhere between 55 and 60 percent of our um, surface water supply protected against uh, the next fire uh, is an important thing to do. So I won't be looking at supporting above ground without a uh, analysis of both and a, and a fair one, not one that's colored with the fact that I, it appears you've reached a conclusion already. I, I, I'm, I'm deeply concerned about this. And I think our community will be as well. This is part of what needs to be communicated to the community uh, in a fashion so that, so that they can understand why we wouldn't be doing it. Okay, thanks, Bob. Uh, Jeff? So I was going to touch on what Bob just said there. Um, if we're doing community outreach on this project, which I believe we absolutely must, um, we have to consider how they are going to react to above ground versus below ground, et cetera. And we have to understand that most of them are not engineers, most of them are not construction experts, and so we have to give them the information to make a clear cut, a, a clear decision in their mind uh, with our outreach program. But we're going to have a, a lot of pushback if we don't do something to protect the fire, protect oh. the fire. So back to life. No, oh, I, I totally oh. get that. Yeah. Um, I, I, we're not making any decisions tonight. Understand on how we're going to construct this pipe. Well, what, uh, wait a sec, though. I mean, what? what I'm Rick unclear. Was, what, what Rick was talking about made it sound like we actually are making a decision based on I, how he wanted I, to move ahead. I I disagree with Rick's. Uh, uh, we're just going to go ahead and put this back on the ground. No, I I don't agree with with Rick's statement on that. So, I think we need the infra some of the information that Josh just putting out in front of us here, in particular, the opinion of probable cost for option one. We don't have that yet. What does it cost us 
to put this back in with um, option one or alternative one as referred to in the Fer and Loretta study is just putting the pipe back on the ground as Rick is describing it. Um, I think having that cost helps inform um, decisions on how we move ahead. So I think we need that um, before we can move ahead with with this. And that's one of the next uh, next steps that Josh is recommending. So, uh, Gail? Um, I guess I'm still a little unclear of what we're being asked to decide tonight, but um, it, but I guess one question I would ask would be um, whether this isn't a absolute. In other words, it, maybe it's possible that there would be, uh, you know, I, I don't know the details of the Peavine, but maybe it wouldn't be impractical to bury it there, but then take a different approach on the steeper terrain on the five mile segment where we would just simply say that the environmental effects would be so bad um, or the potential for landslides and debris flows. And so there we would put it on, on the surface. I, I, I guess I don't, I don't buy that we have to decide that it's either or and that maybe different parts um, are, are different. Now, I do get Rick's point that um, if you uh, have, you, you can't sort of mix and match because as soon as, you know, one part of the pipe burns, then the stuff gets uh, sucked into other yep. parts and contaminated. So, um, you know, that that's kind of a foolish idea that you could somehow manage to just put it in some places and you'd be okay. Um, but I, I just wonder, maybe I just like Rick's response of whether he, and Josh's too, whether whether he thinks that there's quantitatively a difference between Peavine and the rest that would justify us thinking about two different approaches. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in first. I don't I don't believe so. Um, you know, you know what it'll take to bury the pipe. You you have to go in there and do something more similar to the FNL's proposal. And when you look at Kasunich's proposal, which is more reasonable and really understands the mountain, works with the mountain, that is an environmental disaster to try to bury 100%. If you can't bury 100% of that pipe and the maintenance that you will create trying to bury it and keep it buried, it, it's not worth the time. And then you start looking as to Mark's point, the most cost-effective, the least expensive method will be putting it back like it was. And then you'll have, you'll be able to take those numbers and look how many times you'll be able to replace that pipeline um, when you look at the cost of it to, to bury the FNL. You're looking at retaining structures or some types of retaining structures to try to bury. You do not want retaining structures on that mountain. Because with retaining structures, you've got maintenance. But that's farther down the road. What I don't want, I can tell you the EIR process with burying it is going to be quite lengthy. And then that will put us, which I don't want to try to um, sacrifice, you know, protection of the pipe, if that's the way the board wants to go, but it will take probably quite some time. And we're trying to figure that out. We're working with our environmental consultants now what it will take to get through that EIR process if we look at a berry with retaining walls. I think you're going to be considerable and maybe even challenged by environmentalists in the San Lorenzo Valley who understand that mountain. Okay. Josh, you want to... Bob? Or, Wait, I, let, I, let Josh pipe in. Oh, okay. Thank you. I don't have a Josh? whole lot. I don't have a whole lot to add to that. I would say, sorry about the dogs. They're a little excited. The wife's out of town, so they're right here. Uh, I would say that if we cannot protect one hundred percent of the pipe, we probably shouldn't protect any of it. And the reason for that is the VOC issue. I would hate to protect most of the pipe and then just have to dig it back up and while i'm 
you know, I, I'm on record as being 100% behind this pipe should be protected, whatever we have to do, because, well, I'm the engineer, not the finance guy. So that's where my opinion comes from. I believe it's all or nothing for Peavine and all or nothing for Five Mile, and they don't have to be the same answer. Thank you. Okay. Um, Bob, did you have further comment? Yeah, I, I, I'm deeply concerned that it seems like we've already reached a conclusion, at least at, at staff level. And I'm concerned about how that's going to impact and color the analysis that comes forward. Um, I, I, I'm, yeah, this is, we, we are in fact, uh, at this point, whether we think we are or not, uh, if we proceed down this path, I think we've already made that decision. It's going above ground. I, I cannot support that at this point. Um, sorry. Um, okay. I, and I, so I'm not sure exactly how to vote here because, first of all, it's still not clear what we're voting on. And second of all, I, I'm, I, th I think the conclusion's already been reached, and they, even before we go out to public uh, for uh, the public outreach. Okay. Um, since I've heard from uh, uh, more than one board member, you're not sure what we're being asked to vote on here. I'd like to uh, propose that staff do further work on uh, what the next step or next steps are and come back uh, to either the committee, preferably, or the board with, here's our plan. Here's what we are proposing to do. Um, because we have one, two, five different uh, items here that are next steps. And I, I don't, I'm not hearing concurrence on all of those next steps, nor what is it that we're being asked to do? I so we're just being asked for the board to accept the, uh, the Heroka Sunich report tonight. Mm, and we can come back to the engineer. That's not, that's not the but way that I'm reading there. the executive <laughs> summary. Yeah, exactly. And, and it's and instruct staff to submit. Uh, for uh, to the full review for what the next um, um, yeah there, it was asking us for a recommendation on what the next step should be so um, if we agree that um, I want to make the motion then let me do this I want to make the motion that we agree to accept the peer review report and request the staff to come back to us with uh, further description on what the next step or next step should be. I'll second that. <laughs> okay. Um, further discussion of this? Mark, at this point, at this point? Time to go out to the public. Um, I wanted to hear uh, from Gail first, since she has her hand up while I was uh, trying I, to I make just, this motion. Um, I, I realized that, the, yeah. uh, that there was this request to uh, both accept it, uh, the report and then the next steps. But when I look at the next steps, um, I think really the only one that's problematic is the one that you identified already, Mark, which is that it doesn't make sense to do the environmental impact uh, report until we know which way we're going, right? If we're going to bury it, then that's a whole different thing than if we're going to put it above the ground. But the, the other part of it is prepare an opinion for the probable cost of option one or um, option uh, 3B, which is burying it um, everywhere, including at creek crossings strikes me as a perfectly reasonable uh, instruction to the staff. So I, I guess what I'm saying is, um, to me, the next steps minus the RFQ for the EIR is would be acceptable. But that, that's all. Uh, okay. Um. I, after 
uh, thinking about that and looking at this again, I could concur with that if uh, other board members could agree that the other uh, four bullets in here, or the other four items are something that bring additional information back to us for further discussion, but that yeah. we're not deciding on which way to go at this point. Mm. Bob? I disagree. Um, there's a very okay. there's there's a very significant difference in what's being requested. If if you look at the the option one, that is prepare an, an opinion of probable cause. And uh, the next one I'm bearing is review it and uh, you know look at see if it's feasible and maybe you prepare a revised opinion. No, that 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 is not specific enough. And I think okay. there's lots of different there's lots of different ways of being able to approach burying the pipe. And my concern is that we'll also try to look at this from the point of view of what's the worst case, as opposed to what might be more feasible, and basically reject it right out of hand after the review. Um, so no, I mean I'm I'm not prepared to go along with those four bullets the way that it's currently uh, written. But again, I'm, I'm you know it could be a minority opinion here, and that's fine. Okay, uh, I do want to comment on what you're saying there, Bob. I think that uh, the Fair and Loretta report did look at a number of options for um, how to bury uh, yeah. different, 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 let me finish, different okay. piping types that could be used um, in order to prevent uh, damage, uh, being the, the welded steel um, and also using the uh, HDPE. Bob, you admitted that you and I both walked that pipeline. And yes, the, um, I will call it a goat path in a lot of the areas was uh, still accessible. Um, Gail, you're laughing. That's about what it was. There were a number of places where I had to use both hands. Oh, I, I believe you. <laughs> to, to get over yeah. to get over some of these areas, and this is this is where the the pipe had been. Taking equipment in there, I think, will be uh, difficult. But I'm not saying that I'm not saying that we can't do that. I want to okay. see what the cost on that is. Well, I mean, again, there's lots of different ways of being able to bury things. I think is I I disagree. No. I disagree yeah. with that. I think yeah. Farrah Loretta captured that. I I don't. I don't think they did actually, but okay. um, at least not uh, the range of options that are there. I mean, cutting cutting the kind of roads that they had in there and the kind of size of equipment and whether you do it all with equipment or whether you could do some of it with uh, hand digging, um, you know, since we're only going down but, uh, a, a bit. It, look, the, mm -hmm. I, I think the conclusion has already, already been reached. And, I, and so I, I'm, I, and whether, it's been reached before we're even going out to public opinion and doing the rest of it. I, I think it's very clear that the path we're on right now is above ground and that's it. And everything else will be made to look really bad. So we don't want to do burying. Uh, I think it's important to at least get 60% of our uh, water surface water supply uh, protected against the future fires. If we truly believe in the, in the climate change issues that I think we're going to have, mm -hmm. You know, fires every 50 years may not be the case. They may be much faster than that. And as you could see from walking up there, at least I could see it, there's still plenty of fuel up there. Uh, it's not something that, I mean, yes. uh, it, it doesn't have a high rating mm -hmm. from the new fire um, uh, estimates, but it's still pretty, it's still a lot of fuel right. there to burn. Agreed. Okay. Rick, you want to comment? Well, I, I'm, I'm just a, a little bit confused because it, you know, we did go through the process with FNL and we did go through the process with um, Harold Kasunich and we do have knowledge of the pipeline and pipes and material and we did install it. And I think it is staff's responsibility to make a recommendation. And believe me, Josh and I went through many recommendations together before we got to this point. It's not and the board makes the final decision. So it's not like this is 
been just you know done behind closed doors. I mean, we've been working on this for a while and at the engineering committee. So I'm kind of taken back that you know you don't expect a recommendation from staff. And it isn't it isn't what I said at all, actually. Um, what I'm what I'm concerned about here is that we've already reached a conclusion that it's above ground plastic and that's it. And anything else is going to be looked at in the worst possible light. And I, I, I just think we're we're missing it. Can't support moving forward that way at this point. But again, I, okay. you know, if it's four to one, that's fine. Okay, thank you, Bob. Uh, Gina? Yeah, I just wanted to provide a Brown Act reminder that um, public comment should take place before during the board discussion. And so I just wanna make sure that takes place before we get, you know, to the very end of the discussion. Thank you. Agreed. Agreed. <clears throat> okay. Um, so given uh, what I've heard over the last few minutes, I would like to amend the uh, motion that I was making and uh, suggest instead that we approve the staff moving ahead with the four of the next steps listed in the memo, prepare the RFP for the survey of the pipe alignment, prepare an opinion of the probable cost for option one, um, review option 3B with Frere and Loretta and HKA, um, and then present the above information. Okay, the last one isn't the, let's prepare the above information to the committee, but not the RFQ for the environmental report at this point. Can I just make so, a friendly uh, adjustment to that, be, just to make sure, because this is recorded, sure. is that, that the uh, third item there, in addition to reviewing option 3B, also says then prepare a revised opinion of probable cost. Y you didn't read that, and that, that's important. Okay, because, then Because basically please, we're gonna get yes. probable cost of both options. Yes, okay. right. I hate to, to okay. nip all, but the revised motion didn't include accepting the report. But I, I assume you meant to do that, Mark. Yes. Um, yes, to accept the uh, HKA peer review report. Thank you, Gina. I'll second that motion. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, Bob, I'll come back to you for a minute. Now that we have a uh, a more formed motion out there. I would like to hear from anybody from the public and then come back to the board for other comments. Uh, uh, let's see, members of the public. Alina? Hi, Alina Lang, uh, Boulder Creek. And also, uh, you know, I've sit on the Environmental Engineering Committee for the past two years. And when we started down this path, I was with Bob. I really wanted to see this pipe buried, um, but through the discussions and everything that has been presented in the environmental committee, I think my opinion has definitely changed on that. It's really hard to say without having the costs kind of laid out in front of us to kind of make those final conclusions. Uh, but I think really the most important thing right now is to get our surface water back online, the ability to arrest our wells. And, um, you know, we can't really easily get that groundwater back in. But if we do have another fire, we are capable of building the pipe again. So that's kind of where my mind is at right now. I just feel that, um, you know, being it, the environmental impact is going to be too great. And if we can't get 100% berry, there really is no purpose because of the VOC contamination. And I think they're just going to have to have a really strong public outreach on this and everything that we've been presented to in the Environmental and Engineering Committee and also here at the board level, um, you know, explaining that, explaining that, you know, burying our, our raw water pipes up in the mountains does not protect us from a future fire and having water availability to fight the fire and just making sure that connection is really clear for the public. And also if we could come back with that cost analysis, you know, when I was out campaigning, I heard from a lot of people, you know, first the fire and then second, we don't want to have to keep repaying for this pipe again and again when the fires come through. So if we can show them, you know, like how much greater the cost is to bury, 
um, and just show them how much we're saving. And even if we do have a fire come through again, you know, it's worth it to go above ground because, you know, it's going to be X amount of dollars to bury. Um, but um, so um, anyways, I think that's all I really have to say uh, about that. And um, I'm sad that it looks like we're not going to be able to bury it, but I think it's probably what's best to get our surface water back online. Thanks. Okay. Um, I don't see anybody else. Let's see, Mark, Mark Lee, I see your hand go up and go down and go up and go down. You want to comment? <laughs> yes, thank you, uh, Mark. I've read the whole report and I'm quite amazed. This is like a jar, uh, uh, this is like doing a Rubik's cube uh, from an engineering standpoint. Um, I agree with the general, um, method, uh, the proposal, the motion that you propose, but I don't think we should jump to conclusions yet on whether we should bury the, the line or keep it raised on structures where it's appropriate. Also, I, I think it's going to be, it's going to be a hybrid approach. It's going to be an engineering solution where we may need, uh, you know, welded steel in certain places that are exposed and, uh, the, uh, the HT, the HDPE, in other sections. And I think that's gonna be based on our analysis of cost and our ability to actually get in there in each segment uh, of the construction project on just P-Vine. And remember, there's four other areas we've got to look at. So I think we should uh, generally take this kind of as a general motion to look at alternatives, engineering solutions, um, uh, and uh, it's not going to be either or. I think it's going to be both uh, methods for alternative one or three B to be realistic. And let's look at the cost. Let's look at the engineering. Uh, generally, the framework uh, looks good, but I think uh, we don't want to put an RFP out yet until we get that uh, follow on analysis back to the engineering committee and back to the board. And then think about how we want to parse out the environmental impact statement for each section. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, next, uh, Cynthia Vincel. Thank you. I just wanted to say I appreciate Alina's statement and unless there is a way to partition off different sections of the pipe so the VOCs don't travel through the whole pipe if one section is burned, then it there doesn't seem to be a reason to use the welded steel unless there are mechanical um, uh, conditions. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much for all the thought you're putting into this. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, I'd now like to go back uh, to the board uh, for any further comments before we take a vote on this. Uh, Bob? Yeah, my first question, which I wanted to get in, was um, I'm unclear as to what the language is in bullet number one, two, three, four. What is that language again? Um, in the motion? The review option 3B with both Frere and Loretta and HKA to review, to refine required uh, retaining structures and areas infeasible for burial of pipe and prepare a revised option of probable cost. So, is there any reason why we just couldn't say prepare an opinion of probable cost for option 3B? Um, we already have their uh, probable cost in Fer and Loretta's uh, report. Well, we have one for option one as well, right? No, we don't. They didn't give us one for option one. What? They, it was informal and- Yes. Well, was was everything informal or was there, because 
I mean, I recall that the difference between burial and above ground was not substantial. <laughs> um, Josh, do you want to explain the, the differences in this for us rather than? I mean, basically what I'm trying to do is get to where we're using the same language for, for both so that we are looking at I this see. identically mm -hmm. for both. And I understand the, that I understand that what you have to do for above ground versus uh, below ground might be different, but we don't say uh, in the bullet three uh, review and um, you know refine required uh, support structures, mm -hmm. et cetera. We just say prepare an opinion of probable cost for option one. I want it to be. I'm looking for okay. it to be the same. Yeah. The consistency, yeah, and yeah. and that the same diligence is used in both um, options. Right. Okay, Josh, will you address that for us? Certainly. First, I would like to address Director Fultz's final point regarding diligence. Uh, as you can probably tell, Rick and I do not always agree on things, and as a result, everything gets looked at thoroughly from both sides. So that's. As an aside, I suppose, the reason that I wrote those two bullet points in the way that I did is that option 3B was presented in the constructability study with an opinion of probable cost, which was broken down by unit cost. Option one was not. Option one, well, in an effort to reduce expense to the district, the scope of the constructability study only included a cost estimate for the option or um, alternative, as they were calling them, which was recommended for further study. So we don't have the same level of uh, detail in option one and option three B in terms of cost. So what I've my thought process in writing these was we need to build an opinion of probable cost for option one, which is built in detail. To do the same thing for option 3B requires, or perhaps I should say gives us the opportunity to refine some of the assumptions that FNL made based on data that has come out of the HKA peer review and then refine their opinion of probable cost for option 3B so that we are comparing apples to apples. And um, you'll be as creative as possible on looking at the options for burying this. That is minimal environmental impact, but still getting it buried. That is my intention. Okay, great. Well, then I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I did have one other question. Um, Rick, as of this week, what percentage of the district is being served by surface water? Uh, this week, 100% is being served on surface water from two sources, Foreman Creek and um, Fall Creek. And, and how long do we expect that we would be able to serve the district on surface water from those sources? Uh, into the future um, until Peavine, or, or well, how long can we do that uh, under our current situation? I'm not sure of understanding the question, Bob. Under the current situation with this current last rainfall. Um, no, no, I mean in terms of our ability to use okay. surface water in general to serve the entire system. That all depends on rainfall. I, I get that it's rainfall. Assuming we have plenty of rainfall, how long into the future can we continue to serve our entire system from those two surface sources? So well, with, a good, with a good rainfall year, we usually go into about May, uh, 100%. I'm talking with about- a bad rainfall it, year, we can be done as soon as March. I'm not asking about rainfall. Rick, this is a question for you, I think. How long into the future are we able to use these two surface sources to supply our um, uh, entire system, assuming that the rainfall is there? 2023, 2024, is there a milestone? Just you know, Bob, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not understanding your I question. I don't understand okay. your question either. I don't understand it either. 
<laughs> I, I'm, so, I'm confused so also. Under, let, me, let me ask this. Under what conditions are we able to use Fall Creek water outside of uh, the Felton system? Okay, that right now we're using that uh, outside of Felton due to the fact that we are still in an emergency with the CZU fire. Um, and we must, we still stay within our fish, our bypass requirements. Of course. And when will the, um, that emergency situation be relieved to the point where we would not be able to use water from Felton unless we change our water rights? Uh, right now, I can't answer that because depending, you know, that would be uh, decided by public health, fish and wildlife. You know, if if we start getting, say, we got pea vine online, they may reduce um, to get us back within our requirements. Yeah, but still be able to supply surface water um, uh, to 100 percent of the district, even if it's reduced due to the fact the pea vines online. Not all the time, though. I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's a window of time. I'm, I'm having a tough time answering your question. I think what my, Bob my, my is point, trying to point. ask you is when, and the answer is the emergency ends when the pipeline is built. <laughs> Which pipeline? Well, that depends on how the regulatory agency sees it. I mean, I'm not sure how they will see it. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of moving parts here with, with fisheries and um, the repairs. So I, I'm having difficulty. Yeah, no, fair enough. So, I mean, based on what you're saying, Rick, is that we could potentially be able to use surface water from all sources to all um, uh, customers uh, until we get all the pipes back online, or it may be a reduced amount, or as soon as we get Peavine, they may say, hey, you can't use Felton water anymore, Fall Creek water anymore, and the rest of the system. I think that's what you're saying, is that they have the discretion to determine that. I, I think we're speculating. I this. understand that. All I'm saying is getting Peavine online is not, doesn't, um, we're already on surface water 100%, guys, well, without but, but what the, 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 the big thing you're missing here, Bob, without Peavine on, P -Vine online, we had to shut off uh, Foreman Creek and our surface water treatment plant because we didn't have enough water to operate this year. Right. I, I understand so, that. You know, it, it not only we can't use P-Line because we don't have a pipe, but it also took Foreman Creek offline because of the flows were too small. I, I understand that, but it, this is not a binary thing between without P-Line, we aren't on surface water. That's all. Um, all right. It, not you. this time of year. It's the I, fall and I, in the summer. I, it's, the, it's the summertime. I, I, the I'd, like, Thank you. I'd like to get, I'd, gentlemen, I'd like to get back yes, to the, the motion the motion in front of us, the peer review, um, accepting the peer review and the um, next steps as described in the motion. Um, so uh, without further hands up or questions on that, I'd like to put this to a vote. Holly? President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman is absent. Director Falls? I'm trusting you, Josh. Yes. Director, uh, Director Mayhood? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, motion passes of four to um, four to zero. I don't know whether that's unanimous or... Okay, uh, moving on then. Uh, the next item is the uh, Blue Ridge tank replacement. The initial study mitigated negative declaration. Yes, and, um, and the environmental planner will present that to the board. Great, okay. thank you. The district is seeking to replace an existing 40,000 gallon Redwood tank known as the Blue Ridge tank with an 160 gallon tank providing 120,000 gallons of effective storage. The project is in the community of Boulder Creek, south and east of Blue Ridge Drive and north of Short Street. The existing tank is currently undersized and leaking. The district prepared a draft initial study and mitigated negative declaration or ISMND to meet the requirements of the California Environmental Quality Act analysis for the project. The draft ISMND was circulated on October 14, 2020 to, for a 30-day public review period to alert the neighborhood of the project 
and the draft ISMND staff hand delivered letters of notice to homes surrounding the project, posted project descriptions around the neighborhood, made social media posts, and added project information to the district's website. The public review period ended on November 14th, and two comment letters were received. Comments were addressed in Appendix F of the ISMND, linked as Exhibit A. No significant public comment was received, and staff is recommending adoption of the ISMND. Once the board adopts the ISMND, the district will move forward with selecting a construction contractor. Staff and Jessica Coteen from Panorama Environmental Inc., the consulting firm who completed the ISMND analysis on behalf of the district, are both prepared to answer any questions the board or public may have. Okay. Uh, questions on this topic? Uh, Gail? Um, yeah, I. It, it's pretty straightforward. And the only thing I would comment is that when I downloaded the, uh, the report, I noticed that on that figure two, um, which is page 21 of 246, um, shows the tank site literally on top of somebody's house. Um, and I, you know, having recently gone through what happened with Felton Heights, I just looked at that and I went, Psst. and I'm hoping that there's some problem with registration of the diagram over the Google Earth image. Um, but uh, th there's something wrong and um, please fix it before they, they need uh, they need to get their reference points lined up with wgs 84. yeah i mean it well it's a little weird actually because it, you can see where the roads are a little bit off but it, even if you put them back to that it seems like the thing would still be like basically right on some right next to somebody's house so um I, I, could you i i just really think before that needs to be fixed on yes. the website and and if it goes anywhere because if anybody sees that I mean, if I were that homeowner, I would have totally flipped out. But um, obviously, they didn't take a look. <laughs> which could you tell me which figure that was again? Yeah, it's Figure Two, and you refer to it on page twelve of two forty six. Where, but there, it actually comes up as error source reference not found. But then when I go in the text, and then when I go and look at it, Figure Two on page twenty one of two forty six. It, the red line showing the tank is on somebody's house. Yeah, so we actually updated the link. So if you refresh, it should cor have corrected all of that already. Um, but I looked at it like literally an hour or two before the meeting. Yeah, it's. I think I updated it. Um, I just got the updated version from our consultant. Okay. And all right, all right. Very that's recently, She caught that. Okay, it's fixed. <laughs> but it is fixed. Just <laughs> okay, I have nothing more to say. <laughs> okay, uh, Bob? Yeah, um, Carly, for the benefit of the community that may not want to go to the um, report, who respond? Who uh, were the people that responded to the uh, ISMND? Yeah, so we did. We had one community member respond, um, and it was mostly around the uh, parking and traffic control was the comments. And then we also had the, I believe it was the State Water Resource Control Board, Jessica. That's it. Yeah. Yeah, and they had some uh, clarification questions um, on uh, sort of where the temporary tanks would be placed. And then also they wanted to clarify that um, there was a per the permit that would be required through the State Water Resources Control Board. So they just wanted to clarify and point that out. That so was a pretty um, uh, straightforward letter. Yeah, no, great. I mean, that it continues almost the pattern of, I guess in this case, 50% of the responses being mostly from other agencies as opposed to the community. Mm -hmm. Although I am glad to see one person did. Yeah, actually, did could it. I correct that, Carly? Um, I Because I, I just read it and her concerns were, how are we gonna fix the roads after they were torn up? And you changed something in there to say how we would do that. So we addressed it. Paving. Yeah, okay. Great, thanks, Carly. Mm -hmm. Jeff? No questions. Okay. I have a, a couple. Um, who signs this environmental declaration, uh, which is the first page of the ISMND? Is that? It'll be us? Rick or I. Okay. All right. So that's in, that's internal. Um, there are uh, uh, surveys that are described in here uh, for 
butterflies, bees, um, amphibians, bats. Um, could, is there one biologist that we get from, or do we need four different uh, people to? No, yeah, you would have one biologist that would um, okay, good. do a pre-construction survey, uh, you know, whether it'd be like about two weeks before, prior to any um, ground disturbing. So yeah, it's okay. it seems like a lot, but we have to we have to we have to you know clarify and and break them all out. But um, one biologist, okay. right? Overall. Okay, um, and uh, to Gail's point on the figures being referenced as air. Um, yep. in the document in in bold uh, I didn't go back and look have those been corrected also they have been yeah I caught that when I was okay. reviewing the document about an hour okay. ago I saw that when we pdf did it kind of made the error so that's fixed right. okay all right that's all of my questions uh, so um, the motion on this was to uh, uh, ex was it to accept the ISMND for the to Blue adopt. Ridge Tank Replacement? Yeah, you adopt an, uh, the ISMND. Okay, to adopt it? Yes. Okay, I'll make that motion. Second. Okay, uh, let me go out to the public uh, to see if there are any, anybody uh, who wants to comment. I don't see anybody's hand up. Uh, wait, Mark, Mark Lee. I've been going up and down again. That's the only Mr. way to get anyone's attention. Uh, on page uh, on the uh, mitigated negative deck, it looks like mm -hmm. there was a on page um, looks like uh, M, uh, page MND page twenty nine. Uh, the last section, section F, it said there's a conflict with the provisions of the adopted habitat conservation plan, natural community conservation plan. And approved. So, what was the finding? Out of all the findings, there was no impact, right? Uh, you're talking about, oh, yeah. So, conflict with the provisions of an adopted HCP. Is that what one you're referring to? Yes. No and then there was no the impact. Project. Yeah, because no that, the project doesn't conflict with um, a HCP. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, I don't see anybody else from the public with their hand up. Uh, so, Holly, would you take a roll call vote? President Smalley? Yes. Vice President Hill? Yes. Director Ackman is still absent. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Mayhood? Aye. Okay. Um, that concludes the the new business section. Um, now, I'd like to move to the consent agenda. Um, it has two items on it: the board meeting minutes and the annual disclosure of report of capacity charges. Uh, does anybody uh, want to comment on either of these? Uh, and if I, if I, if I may just sure. preferably mark first um just as a reminder um these items are deemed adopted if uh nobody pulls one and there's no vote but if anybody wants to discuss either of these items it should first be pulled from the consent agenda for regular discussion oh okay um uh, well i and see I, I this that kind of poorly but you know we want to first pull something from the consent agenda if it's going to be discussed so that that way anything that remains on the consent agenda can just be adopted by silence okay, okay. so first we have to find out uh, what bob wants to discuss am i correct like, yes i'd like to pull the um 12 1 22 uh, board of director minutes um, okay, so we can, uh, uh, by consent, agree that the annual disclosure report uh, is accepted. Yes, yeah, since Correct. nobody's pulling that, that'll be adopted by consent and the okay. meeting now become a essentially a regular agenda item for discussion. Okay. 
and then the uh, board meeting minutes from 12-122 that Bob wanted to pull. Do we discuss that now or? Um, I, I have a, clear. yeah, I have a, I have a, a sentence I'd like to add after um, in the leak adjustment notice of appeal. Let's see, that would be 11C. And I'd like to add a sentence to uh, number two. So the sentence would read, staff stated they were changing the leak adjustment and leak and leak adjustment appeal processes to include owners and not tenants. I'm sorry, where does this go, Bob? Yeah, this would go under um, 11C, leak adjustment notice of appeal, number two, um, which is under um, Gene Nichols commented, so he's, yeah. there's one, two, and at the end of that comment, I wanted to include, staff stated they were changing the leak adjustment and leak adjustment appeal processes to include owners only and not tenants. If, if you're making a motion to that effect, Bob, I would second it. Yes, I, sorry, I am making a motion to add that sentence. Thank you, Kale, for reminding me. Okay. I don't have any comments on that. I don't see that Jeff is either. Uh, can we proceed with a vote on this? No, now? the public has to comment, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, let's see. I don't see anybody from the public wanting to comment on it. So, uh, Holly, can you take a roll call vote on this one? The amended minutes. President Smalley. Yes. Vice President Hill. Yes. Director Ackman is still absent. Director Fultz. Yes. Director Mayhood. Yes. Okay, uh, moving on then, uh, the district reports, the district manager's report. Rick, you're muted. Yes, I did want to report that uh, the district is 100% uh, on surface water, as we spoke earlier tonight. Um, from the, the rain, we got uh, close to six inches, I think 5.8. 5.9 inches here at the district office. It did bring up um, uh, flows in our streams and we are 100% including our, our south system on surface water. And until uh, this, if it drops back or the next rain and it will continue for a while. Great, good. And I, I'm blanking on the name of the individual that uh, you uh, pointed out in the report that did all of this work to lead Jesse the effort. To, yes, yes. Jesse Jesse. He, uh, uh, kudos to him for being able uh, to get this done. Yes, it, uh, it, it's a quite an undertaking to turn the system around from summer to winter, um, and they were short staffed, and they have some new staff and. Uh, he's did a fantastic job. Okay. Um, next, uh, we have the uh, department status reports. Uh, do we have any uh, questions from board members on those? Bob? Yes. Did you want me to go through them all at one time on all the sure. reports? Or, yeah, okay. Um, why don't, hopefully, why don't you these. Yeah, hopefully these are sort of you know quick hits. Um, this was this is in the engineering report. I was curious how many attendees at the Fall Creek Fish Ladder um, project meeting, bid meeting, pre bid meeting. It was a fair number. If you give me about thirty seconds, I will give you an exact. Yeah, uh, was it more than five? 
between people who were there and people who made other arrangements to view the site at another time, yes. That's great. Hopefully we'll get some really, hopefully we'll get a lot of bids on that one. Um, do we have an idea of the lion slide um, replacement road cost yet? That cost is, it's been kind of all over the map. I am, well, at the this old point, road replacement was 15 million. I, with the new road replacement, I'm hopeful it'll be less. <laughs> we are looking at between nine and 11 million to be refined more once FEMA tells us whether or not they're going to accept the project. And that's on the on the new route still. Correct. Ugh. Okay, and that was my next question of <laughs> is FEMA going to cover it and how much? <laughs> that is a, a question to be determined. Okay. Um, did the uh, walk with the county uh, that took place two days ago go well? Are we done with Quail Hollow? We are done with Quail Hollow. Fantastic. And I uh, was a little confused about the Redwood Park tank project. Was the RFP just for the pipe? Correct. The RFP was just for the pipe. The reasoning behind that is that we're going to allow the contractor building the pipeline to use the tank site for staging because there's nowhere else in the area for staging, which prevents them from doing it all at once. Okay. Um, on the environmental report, Carly, it looked like your report got broken. Uh, the columns got pushed off to another page. Would it be possible to get that report in electronic form so I could look at it all on the same line rather than trying to flip back and forth? Sure, I'll, I'll work with Holly on that. Okay, that'd be great. Um, Question for Kendra on the finance report. Do we report to the credit agencies on past due bills? We only report to collection agencies on delete accounts that have not paid their final bill. Great, thank you. Um, on the operations report, I noticed that we aren't including well elevation reports anymore. Are, is, are those available somewhere online? Um, I do include those about every three months now. We were told to take them off of there and not have them on there every report. And I do believe that was you, Mr. Fultz. Uh, you didn't want to see them every I report. Know, I don't know that that was me so much as asking for perhaps a, a different way of presenting the information because I also when did are, that. When, when we are um, when we are on well water, I do want to see. Um, the well elevation levels, or I would yeah. like to see those. I when, just we're on had, surface, when we're I on just surface it, water, I don't sorry. think we need to see it as much when we're on surface water. Right? I agree. I just had it in my October report, I do believe. Okay. Um, but I noticed we're still, as of November anyway, we were still pretty heavily on wells. Um, we were somewhat on wells, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, it looked I like... You a, I can put it in the January report. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and on that, it looked like we were pumping some water from uh, Felton, or actually from, looks like we were pumping some water from Scotts Valley and Felton to the North System, correct? Well, yeah, the water, well, not from Scotts Valley, but from the Paso Wells. That is a bleed line that we keep to keep the pipeline fresh. So we do that every, that's a continuous thing until we start moving water the other way. Okay, so that million gallons going from south to north is just to keep uh, the line fresh. That's correct. It's not for consumption. That's correct. There was a little bit of consumption on that, Bob. I take that back when we were doing the construction project and we had to shut down. And we were doing the changeover of the pipeline. Okay. So there was a slight amount of that, but... Yes, most of that is just a 15 to 20 gallon a minute bleed to keep the pipeline fresh. And that would also count towards the difference between water sold and water produced, right? Yes. Okay. Well, all water that is produced out of a well or out of our treatment plants is all produced water. Right. But I mean, that what what we talked about before was leaks and um, flushing, but there's also this kind of water that might also be used as well. 
Right. Well, that 15 gallons a minute that we use to keep the water fresh in the pipe is going to consumption or leaks. Because oh. it's going into the it's going into the distribution system. Oh well, that's what I was asking is whether that was used for consumption. Okay. Yeah. So so it is all used for consumption except for oh. a little bit. Okay. Yeah, whatever we lose with leaks and whatever went on. Right. Okay. And the same thing for Felton. We pumped about four million gallons to North, and that's all for consumption as well. That's correct. Okay. All right. Great. Thank you. Did, did we lose Mark? Uh, no, briefly, I shut the camera off for just a minute. Uh, Jeff, any questions on these? No. Gail? Okay. Um, I want to go back to uh, one that I asked uh, two weeks ago and again at the engineering committee meeting um, earlier this week. It's regarding the uh, invoices that we've received for the uh, Bracken Brain Forest Springs from Sandus um, and the status of beginning to submit those to DWR. And Rick, you said that you'd do some research on that this week? Yes, I did, uh, Mark. Um, I did hear back from Mr. Bannister. Uh, um, Josh and I both um, uh, sent in uh, questions to him. We cannot submit invoices uh, as of right now, because we don't have the funding agreement, but we need to just turn back in a exhibit and he will uh, process the funding agreement and then we can submit um, um, those invoices. So what's the exhibit that they need from us? Oh, uh, I'd have to, I'll have to dig it up, Mark, for you. Okay. Uh, well then, and when do you think that will be submitted? Uh, um, I just got this email back uh, from uh, yeah. Mr. Bannister this, the 15th. This this year? Yes. Yeah, okay. I want to yeah. discuss with Josh because there's a couple things in here that we want to go okay. over before I respond back. But yes, okay. this year. Good. All right. Those are my, those are my questions at this point. Okay. Um, moving on then. Um, Trying to see, is there anything else we need to cover? Uh, committee reports, I I don't think so. Does anybody else disagree? If, if not, Bob? I had a question for Gina about the uh, letters that are submitted to us that I think is the last item. Um, are we able to comment on those or are those just for informational viewing only? Uh, it is appropriate to comment if um, if there are comments they can be made under that agenda item. I, I do okay. have a comment on the letter. Okay. Um, uh, this letter is from uh, a Deb Lowen, I believe. And she makes a point here about um, you know, SLV's uh, median household income and how I think that's been used in the past as sort of the basis on affordability. Um, and she mentions 23% of the SLV households have an income under 50K. That probably means something like 40% or maybe, or, or maybe more are like under 80K. Um, so I, I would caution us as a board to make sure that we're looking at more than just median household income when it comes to determining affordability on any kind of uh, rate increase that we might uh, put into place. That's all, thank you. Can, can I respond to that, Mark? Is it, um, I, I responded to Deb Lowen's letter um, and, uh, and in part in response to her letter, uh, both Jeff and I at the recent budget and finance committee um, agreed with her that it was important that we include demographic information about the valley because we're a little bit different than um, the county. So, for example, in the financial report, you know, we have the averages for the county, but our dis our district 
is different and it probably has a different income as distribution as you suggested bob so so bit. we we intend to um incorporate that and whether we put it together ourselves or ask the consultants to do it we'll, we'll have to figure out but we'll we will do that and i did reply to deb low on um to the effect of what i just told you no i appreciate that gail i, I think that's great and Hopefully they won't charge too much to look at the census data. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's not very much. I mean, exactly. I could sit down and do it in an hour. And exactly. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. All right. Um, I have a question for Gina. Um, I see that uh, one of our members of the public has his hand up. Do I take other public comments at this point? Yeah. I'm not sure if the hand came up on 13, the reports, or if it came up on 14, the written communication, okay. but I'd recommend allowing. Which, whichever, yes. Okay, good. All right. Uh, Mr. Lee? Um, Mark Lee? Yes, yes. Are we on okay. uh, agenda item three, uh, 13? Okay. Uh, let's go to uh, page 260. 12 and 24, it's on the, uh, in the financials. Might answer okay. it for me. Everyone there? Uh, there. We'll, there. We'll, we'll get there, but go ahead and ask your question. Okay, so we have all these uh, accounts that are uh, sitting in the county. We also have Wells Fargo, uh, Santa Cruz County uh, Fund under operating accounts and operating balances. One shows it at six million eight hundred thirty-one thousand one five eighty-seven, and then you drop down. You drop down to the restricted accounts of uh, several uh, uh, different accounts that uh, with the, our loans essentially that we, we have residing at the county treasury uh, in the CC, uh, CCCF fund, uh, totaling or, or essentially twenty-one billion four hundred sixty-eight thousand three hundred seven dollars. Uh, some of those are large funds. It looks like they're only earning 1.12%. I think we talked about this at the last meeting uh, on finance. Uh, are we going to uh, explore uh, getting some higher yields on these accounts and uh, perhaps by investing in laddering into six-month and one-year CDs at, with no, uh, no fees or consulting fees? Is my question so we can get a better yield. Uh, we have a we're, lo we're losing quite a bit of money. Uh, I think uh, we talked about this that we were losing about uh, thirty thousand per one million dollars in revenue compared to the outside market. Today's uh, six month T bills are issued at four point six five. Uh, it va vacillates every day, of course. But once you lock in, they can become very valuable, especially as people began buying more CDs during a turndown. So uh, that's my general question. Can we start exploring, looking at some brokers uh, that would uh, provide us that sort of investment opportunity and, and pull that money out of the county? And I, I'm just going to okay. provide a quick brownout caution here because... Yes item was not agendized for board action, um, including providing direction to staff. And so um, a brief response would be appropriate, but I just want to caution against getting into a board discussion of the merits. Of that, that's fine. That's fine. Uh, just, can, I, can I just, as uh, the chair of that committee, um, acknowledge that, that we did hear from Mark at length, and um, I would like to turn it over to Rick to just give a brief response. Okay. Make sure I'm unmuted. Yeah, a brief response. We are looking into that and we'll be bringing that to the um, budget and, and finance committee uh, for further review. Um, we are also looking through our projects and seeing, you know, which which funds we could, um, you know, the, the, the um, the ideas behind those loans were to do construction projects and for several different reasons, those projects have not moved forward. So it would be prudent to, to look into this and we plan to uh, 
at the first budget and finance committee meeting in January. So the answer is yes, we'll look into that, but we'll also have to balance with um, cash flow needs. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you then. Um, well, I think that uh, concludes this uh, public meeting. Um, without further comments or objections, I'd like to go ahead and uh, adjourn. Um, to close session. Mark, yeah. Uh, no, we'll go back to close right. session. Yes. Mark, could we have a five minute break? Um, reconvene it. Certainly. Nine ten. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. See you there. And uh, for any members of the public that are still online, I just wanted to to clarify. Uh, earlier, it was said that um, there aren't any reports that are going to be expected out of closed session, and so we won't be coming back into open session to give any reports because there won't be any. So the meeting will just adjourn once we um, once we leave the closed session.